Good evening and thank you all for joining us on Facebook Live for tonight's exclusive News Channel 9 candidate forum for District 8. I'm your moderator for tonight, Farron Franzek. Now this is the seat vacated by city rep Courtney Nyland and covers much of downtown El Paso as well as some of the west side and the upper valley. Tonight the five candidates running for her open seat are here with me. I'll be asking them questions as well as you via our Facebook Live feed. Also on Twitter using the hashtag NC9Vote. So to start things off tonight, I'll have the five candidates introduce themselves as well as a little bit about themselves and why they're running to represent for District 8. We'll start with you, Mr. Lopez. Yes, uh, my name is Adolfo Lopez. I'm a local uh, attorney. I was uh, born and raised in El Paso. My mother had me when she was 19 years old. I uh, w went to a Faith Christian Academy. I uh, went to St. Mary's for undergrad. I then went, came back to El Paso. Uh, I worked as a substitute teacher, a server, a busser, and during that time, I got my MBA at UTEP. Uh, from there, I went to law, a small law school in Seattle, Washington. I then worked with the Dallas County District Attorney's Office for four years, then opened up my own uh, legal practice. I've been a solo practitioner, uh, focusing on criminal defense for three years. Uh, moved back to El Paso uh, two years ago. Um, last year, I ran for state representative uh, for District 77, which uh, overlaps uh, much of it with uh, District 8. Uh, during that time, I blocked walked uh, the entirety of uh, District 77 and got to know uh, the majority of the constituents uh, in District 77. And I believe uh, we do need to reduce, uh, alleviate pro uh, property taxes on many of our homeowners. Uh, that was one of the things I, I ran across when I was uh, block walking. Uh, I believe the uh, transparency and ethical concerns of city council is something I am afforded as an attorney to be very knowledgeable on, and that's something where uh, the other s seven city council members along with the mayor may not have as much of a legal background, but that's something that is a strength that I have, and that's something that I believe that um, I bring to city council. Uh, along with uh, my, my heritage here in El Paso and my experience overall. I believe that for those reasons, I am the best candidate for District 8. All right, Mrs. Um, Lizarraga, did I say that correctly? Yes, you did. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sissy Lizarraga. Thank you, Channel 9, for inviting us here today. I am ready to serve as an accountable, ethical leader in District 8. I, have, I am proud of my deep roots in El Paso, in particular District 8. I was born at Hotel Du, attended St. Patrick's and Loretto Academy, worked in my father's uh, business in South El Paso. I have a business a Bachelor of Science degree in education from UTEP and a master's degree in education from the University of Texas at El Paso. I am a retired educator in the public system and I am a mother of three beautiful, successful women. I'm a grandmother, a wife for 41 years, and a concerned citizen. And that's why I'm running to represent you in District 8. I am um, I'm a consensus builder also, with the courage to speak out when needed. But more importantly, I am a great listener. I'm a fiscal conservative, and I will work hard to watch our tax dollars. My name is Sissy Lizarraga, and I want to represent you in District 8. All right, Mr. Guillen. Karen, good evening. I grew up here in El Paso in the same house that we've always been to. I've lived downtown. I've, uh, I'm a graduate of Cathedral High School, and I'm a graduate of UT El Paso. Since as far back as I can remember, I've been involved in my community. I was the first vice president at the Hispanic Chamber, the assistant vice president at the Greater Chamber, the president and CEO of the United Way of Southern New Mexico, and the president and CEO of the BHI, that entity that helped develop the area for the, uh, for the new medical school. And for the past few years, I was retired and until I started seeing what was going on with city council. I started seeing the, the disarray, the misinformation, the perceived corruption that happens in our city council. And you get to a point where you just kind of get a little bit fed up. We uh, were the highest tax county in all of Texas. And in America, of those counties of our size, we're in the among, amongst the top 4%. We pay the highest electric rates in the in the, the state of Texas and they still want to raise our rates some more. And you just see the way city council has been operated, you see the administration. For some reason there's a refusal to listen to the citizens of El Paso and to the other politicians. Uh, for example with the arena 
everyone is telling them that it doesn't go there. 98% of all the people who went to the arena meetings that were touted around throughout the city voiced their opinion of not to put it downtown, and yet the city still persists. I believe that city council exists to serve all of El Paso, not just a few individuals, but all of El Paso. And for this reason, I'm running for city council. All right, Mr. Guillen, thank you. And Mr. Cormel. I'm Robert Cormel. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, really appreciate that. Um, I'm a business owner um, for, for many, uh, since the age of 16, I started my first business um, for over 30 years. We've, um, I know what it is to run and operate a business. Um, 20 years ago, we started a nonprofit organization on the east side of town that works with youth and families. We've been doing that for many, many years. And a lot of those um, young people that we've mentored over the years are live here in, in the city. And we, we believe that um, there's poor representation for all of El Paso. I think there's a lot of things that have gone on in the last years that have made um, us as a council, as the council, and um, as a city look bad. And I think that uh, it's important for us to get along together as a family and, and realize that we're not in districts fighting for, you know, just a parcel of land here in El Paso, but we're fighting for all of El Paso. We want to see the city thrive, and we want to see um, the people, the young hundreds of kids that I've mentored over the years um, grow up in a city that, that is successful and does well and where they can raise their families and um, be safe and have good roads to drive on. And that's one of the reasons that I'm running. I'd love to have your vote. All right, Mr. Carmel, thank you. And wrapping up tonight's first question, Mr. Acevedo. Hi. Good evening, Tara. And thank you to KTSM for this opportunity to introduce our platforms on our ideas on how to fix this district, district 8. My name is Trini Acevedo and I'm 47 years old. I was born and raised in District 8. I attended all of my public schools in District 8 from elementary all the way to high school. I'm a proud boy graduate. I also attended UTEP and obtained my bachelor's from the University of Texas at El Paso. I have a master's in public administration from Grand Canyon and I'm currently a doctoral student in organizational leadership. I am running for District 8 because I believe that we need to start empowering our people. We need to empower our neighborhoods in order to bring progress. There's not only two issues in District 8, but multiple issues that need to be addressed. The arena is one. I have been one of the candidates that, that has always been against eminent domain and of the displacement of people. If change is gonna be possible, Communication is the best process. If there's no communication, then change breaks down. I believe that my contribution to city council is bringing in what my educational background. I have worked for 27 years with the University Medical Center of El Paso as a healthcare provider, and I have 10 years as an educator at the El Paso Community College, where I think we need to start being inclusive of all the diversity that includes in District 8, such as generational diversity, cultural, and socioeconomic. My name is Trini Acevedo, and I want to be your strong voice in City Council. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Acevedo. So now on to our first question. So this vacated seat, it happened pretty abruptly. Many of the voters that we talked to in your district today, they say that they have no encouragement to go out and vote this year, and many don't know who you are because there hasn't been a long time to campaign. A lot of them also saying that they're very fed up with what they saw this year with the city council. So first question, how do you plan to get people to get out and vote? We'll start with you, Mrs. Lisa Lisaraga. Well, I think people aren't going to vote because uh, you're absolutely correct. People aren't excited about the election or about candidates and their ideas. And I, I, have, I do have a five point agenda that I have on my website and I'm excited about. The first one, um, of course, is safe roads and, and streets and road uh, improvements, which a lot of the different races are talking about. But one of the issues that's really exciting for me is uh, pertains to solar power and alternative energy. El Paso is the fourth sunniest, biggest city in the United States for its size. And I think we're not doing enough uh, to to utilize our, our 
our greatest resource that we have, which is the sun. And I, as a city council, I would serve as a voice to advocate to support and grow clean, green energy. And I would look into in innovations to the, the prices of solar panels are tumbling down right now. And I think that we have a resource and I would work hard to develop that resource. Mr. Ginn, how do you plan to get people to get out and vote? You know what, the, uh, the citizens of El Paso are pretty disgusted with everything that's going on. This past uh, election, we saw an 8% turnout, which is really, really bad. As we're doing our block walkings, um, I disagree a little bit because as we're talking to people, people are excited about change. People are excited about getting someone in you that's more responsible. The people that I've talked to are excited about getting someone in there that will fight and will stand up for what is right. Not someone that's manipulated by someone else or backed up by, by a particular special interest group, but someone that will just represent the people. And so that, I think, is going to bring out the, uh, the voters in District Day to vote this coming June 10th. Mr. Cormel, your answer. I think the, the most um, we can do as a candidate is to get out and knock on those doors. You, you've got to um, put yourself in front of them, your face in front of them. They've got to know you. And um, I have, you know, we've had the bagel shops for 15 years um, here in, the, um, in El Paso. And I've met a vast majority of these people that live in that area um, with our original bagel shop. And um, I think just encouraging them and, 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 and saying, hey, don't give up on this process. It's, it's important. And um, it's the only thing we got. And I think we're going to see, we'll be surprised the turnout for this election because I think that there are a lot of people that are, in fact, um, interested in this, in this particular race. And they want to see some change. And I think I'll provide that. Mr. Acevedo? What a wonderful opportunity to go ahead and engage the voters of District 8 to have active participation in this process. It is just like President Obama recently stated, what you vote for is what you're gonna get. If you vote and want change and want credibility and reestablish trust in your local government, you need to go with someone that has the credibility and the trust and has also the approach of working with neighborhood associations, of empowering people, and reestablishing that trust, that they have open communication at all times with their leadership. And someone that will go ahead and go back to city council and reestablish that respect and dignity, not just amongst city council members, but amongst all El Pasoans that go and have a voice in city council at all times, respect and dignity and decorum to address all the issues that not only affect District 8, but everyone in El Paso. And that is something that Trini Acevedo will deliver. Right, thank you, Mr. Acevedo. And wrapping up our, our first question, Mr. Lopez, how do you get people to get out and vote? Well, I don't think there's any magic pill. I, I think that's something El Paso's dealt with um, since I, I can remember. I wrote uh, my entry pa my, um, paper to... Uh, St. Mary's for undergrad on uh, voter apathy. And so I do believe knocking on doors, uh, that's, I mean, that, that's a huge thing. But I do think it takes more than just that. I think it actually takes every citizen that is concerned to actually grab another person that they know is registered to vote and literally sometimes take them and grab them and make them go vote. I have done that with my own friends. I'm sure uh, the candidates here have done that as well. But it, it, takes, it takes all of us to actually encourage another person until issues affect us personally and, and we know that that it's our vote that changes these things th through uh, changing uh, people we're not happy with with our, our city officials but it's only through that uh, that we actually affect change we, we have to do it grassroots and it, it's a whole citywide project it isn't gonna it's gonna take city leaders along with the citizens to make those changes all right as far as the arena project, that is one of the biggest things that has been in the news. Um, Duranguito has been kind of the, the place of where they would like to put the arena, and that currently lies in your district. So where do you stand on the arena project? We'll start with you, Mr. Guillen. You know what? The arena does not belong in that small neighborhood. It just doesn't fit. The city has contended that they want it there because of its proximity to the convention center. They can apply for 
tax rebates from the state controllers of up to $25 million. For those of us that understand, truly understand downtown, we know that 90% of all the retail sales in downtown is directly attributed to Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, and Mexico. And so when the Mexican shopper leaves, right before they leave, Ferran, they stop at Melec, they do a manifiesto, and they get their taxes back. So there's very few tax money available that we can apply for of up to $25 million. Simply not going to work. Number two, if it was the only spot, then okay. But we know that it's not the only spot. Uh, the city owns Cohen Stadium. The city has set aside $20 million for land acquisition. By simply moving the arena to Cohen Stadium, where it fits, it has parking, and it has access to 54, we save a hard 20. Not apply for up to maybe $25 million, we save a hard 20. UT El Paso has already mentioned that they would love to team up with the city to build a grander structure over at the Asarco properties, and they would donate those properties. And yet our city council refuses to look at anything else because they're only serving a handful of people instead of looking at the whole picture for El Paso. Where would you like to see the arena go? Anywhere but the Union Plaza neighborhood. Okay. Mr. Cormel? I think um, I don't really like, I'm not crazy about the arena being parked there, um, but I think that the truth is, is that that that's already set in motion. By the time we take office, we're, we're talking about two and a half months down the road very easily. And uh, I think it'll already be in motion. That the thing that's going to be important is how do we manage that? Do we make sure that we get the biggest bang for the buck? How, what, what kind of people are, who in the community will come and, and invest in that to help us complete it on time, properly, and get the best bang for our buck? So I, I, I think that's where we need to be. So you are for keeping it in the Durangito area? Well, I, I, we're, we're already there. We all know that. We, we know that, that that's already moving forward. The city's already acquiring those properties. I think it's a mute point. For you, Mr. Acevedo. Uh, the, it's, it's a very touching subject, the arena. Having grown up you know, with friends from Leon Street and Durango Street that attended Bowie High School with me and that actually reside in that area, and some of them are still there. It's a very touchy situation and subject. I believe there's a lot of area in downtown where we can go ahead and place that arena. Evidence-based research has stated that that will go ahead and provide a boost to economic development, something that downtown needs. Retail, unfortunately, will not come back, and this is due to the evolution of technology. We have even seen that affect Macy's, JCPenney, Payless, and other stores. The trends of how people are buying now have changed. And we have to adapt now. We have to think outside the box. And we have to move forward. We need to move forward with change. We cannot stay stagnant. If not, our downtown's going to die. Sunland Park is already on life support, like I said. And we need to move forward. But we can only move forward if there's a leader, a voice for change, and a communicator. And that person is me, Trini Acevedo. So to be clear, though, you're okay with the arena being in the Duranguito neighborhood? No. No. So you think it should be go? Where else? Where do you think it should go? I think the, there's a great slot right there in the railroad where, you know, a lot of people have mentioned it. I think we can slate it in there. Um, I believe, I totally support that the railroad move outside like they had stated they were going to move out to Santa Teresa mm -hmm. and avoid a lot of uh, safety issues and hazards that could occur due to the railroad still being here in inner city, mm -hmm. such as in Chihuahuita or down even by UMC. God forbid, you know, there's a chemical spill. I mean, just to contain that spill it would be a safety hazard. Mr. Lopez, where do you think the arena should go? I'm in favor for the Duranguito area. Um, I think the big concern is eminent domain should be rarely used. Uh, however, uh, the prospector, UTEP's uh, newspaper, did a three-part study in November, and they, they noted that a lot of the homes there didn't even have heating. And so we're dealing, I, I think, with a couple of issues with, uh, of course, there are historical buildings uh, down there, but um, it, Honestly, all of downtown is historical, including Segundo Barrio. Uh, but 
we have to make sure that these people who already have homes that are dilapidated are getting stipends, which they are, and, and making sure that they're moved comfortably and reasonably. And so long as that is done, I believe in a synergistic effect taking place in El Paso with the ballpark. People, we saw that there was a lot of controversy initially with our ballpark, but I believe that has trans, helped transform part of downtown, but it is only part of an idea. Studies go back to 2001. There is a, I believe it's P.L. Johnson uh, study uh, that noted the best area for an arena would be exactly where Duranguito is. Uh, an HKS study back in 2006 cited the same location. Uh, the, there's two independent studies done by uh, two law firms, same location. There is something I believe going on in El Paso right now. We are going through some growing pains, but I do believe in the growth, the trolleys, uh, the convention center, and the private investment that is going into downtown that creates the arena to have a, a special effect that I, I think will contribute to the growth of El Paso. And finally, Mrs. Lizarraga, yes. where should the arena go? Well, I had two, first of all, I had two issues with the Duranguito uh, site. Uh, the first one being the historical preservation, and the second was the displacement of the residents, but to the city's credit, the, they were able to take care of that without the use of eminent domain. And so um, now the arena, I do believe the arena should be built downtown in District 8, preferably if it's not in Duranguito, I have uh, heard good arguments about placing it at the Asarco site. Uh, if elected, I would not want to undo all the hard work that the city council has done. We're losing money every day. Uh, that the project has not started, and so I believe, as Mr. Cormel stated, this is almost a done deal. And just piggybacking off of that, um, we have our first Facebook Live question in from David. He, you were talking about historical buildings. Um, David wants to know, how do you plan on preserving historic buildings in the downtown? And we'll start with you, Mr. Cormel. Oh, great question. Um, you know, we, we moved to the downtown area about almost eight years ago, my wife said, got this great idea, let's go fix her up a house down there. And so uh, <laughs> in the process, we realized that um, when we bought our house, we'd been there about two days and we kept looking across the street at a condemned house. And we we're like, man, this, that, this is a wreck to walk out to every morning. And we ended up finding out how we could get, get a hold of that house, buy that house, and we ended up fixing it up. And it's totally original. We love that house. It's probably one of the neatest houses that we own. But since that time, we've we bought a house, another house across the street that's two, door, two doors down. We've turned it into an Airbnb. And this, gives, this is how you revitalize a, a, an area. You know, you don't just talk about like, hey, let's throw some money down there. But you move down there. You invest in the kids. Um, when we moved to that area, we realized that within 300 yards, there were five kids that, that didn't have fathers. And um, all those kids have been in and out of our house and we've mentored them and spent time with them. We've got them in the mentor programs. And that's how you revitalize a community. You invest in it. You invest in the schools with your time. And um, that's what we want to do. And, that's, and, and that's, that's how you do. Mr. Acevedo? I believe in sharing. And we need to share the resources with our county and identify all those jewels that we have in the downtown. A lot of them, unfortunately, I mean, have either disappeared or their facade is falling apart. Um, right at the corner where McCroy's used to be. And the stories that we hear of Pancho Villa enjoying uh, the milk, milkshakes right there, uh, those are things that have disappeared. And with change, I understand that there, there can be some demolishing but we need to preserve what's historical. What tells the story of El Paso? What can we can share with our future generations? What you all can, whenever you walk through downtown El Paso, almost live what happened in the past. We have a diverse community, such a cultural diversity that we can share and we can always use that as an educational opportunity to teach our future generations in preservation. Mr. Lopez, how do you plan on preserving the historic buildings downtown? I would work with the El Paso Historical Commission. I would make sure that we are using, when we can, using private monies to do uh, revitalization, encouraging tax, tax abatements that don't give away the farm, 
but that do encourage growth, whether that be for private residences, as Mr. Cormel said. Uh, there's all through the area, uh, the Rio Grande, Arizona area, Sunset Heights, there are, very, there are many beautiful historic homes. In uh, all of downtown, there are, the Bassett Tower is going to be redone. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we've seen what the Mills uh, building, what's been done with that building. Uh, there, there are, we need to make sure that we are encouraging private investment and not put uh, taxpayers on the hook, not using public monies, but encourage private development and working with the Historic Commission. There was a study done in 19, I believe, 98 by the El Paso Historic Commission that identified, I think, just about every historical building, uh, at least within the downtown area, and I want to say within uh, the Arizona Rio Grande area and Sunset Heights. And it's working smartly, working wisely, efficiently, and I think working together with uh, state officials, county offic officials, and, and uh, Working as a unit together, I think that's how we make uh, preserve our, our historical buildings. Mrs. Lizarraga? Well, I agree totally with what Mr. Lopez had to say. In addition, um, I'm a, a resident of Sunset Heights, which many people refer to as the heart and soul of El Paso. It's a wonderful neighborhood to be a part of. We purchased our home in 2009, and we were able to restore it. But I would also work hard to increased tax bait, abatements for when people that are working on historical preservation for residences. You have to spend at least $50,000 at a time if you're going to restore a histor uh, renovate a historic house in, in a neighborhood. And so I would wor also work to lower that amount. Mr. Guillen, finally wrapping you know, up with you. The, the way to restore um, historic buildings is, is, is a process. In 1998, the city of El Paso, not the county, but the city of El Paso did a study in the Union Plaza District, and they submitted to, um, to the council then that Union Plaza be declared a historic neighborhood, which did not happen yet. The, uh, the county of El Paso earlier this year accepted um, uh, a grant in order to assess all throughout all of downtown assess an inventory of historic buildings. Once that happens, we'll create a historic overlay in the downtown area, and then we will be able to apply for the most generous funds available to, um, to do the historic buildings. Part of our challenge, though, is greed. You know, uh, we've talked about all the uh, studies that supposedly has picked Union Plaza as, as the spot, and the reality is it didn't happen. The only one that did was funded it was that particular study was funded by the uh, Paso del uh, Norte group, and that was more of a prospectus for real estate development. They came in, they bought the properties, they have not moved on it yet, and so it's the city's uh, role to make sure that those buildings are well taken care of, based on everything, all the work that has been up done up to now. The Paso del Norte, the Paso del Sur group submitted the petitions to create an overlay in the uh, Union Plaza district. It'll go before city council, it'll get turned down, and then they'll pick up another 22, 2,500 signatures, and then it'll go to the voters, and the voters will decide. And I saw, Mr. Lopez, you were shaking your head no. Well, I was just disagreeing with uh, some of the comments he made about the uh, studies. I know the H I've re read the HKS study. It's online. I mean, you can look that up. They looked at four sites. They looked at... Uh, uh, the business district they looked at, and it, it can be a little confusing because the way they label the districts aren't what we would typically associate. So they don't call it Union Plaza. So it took a, a, a little looking through, but that's it's just inaccurate. That the the 2001 study, it's I believe it's the PC or PL Johnson and the HKS studies. They they have ex exactly fo uh, uh, drawings of where they want to put the arena and. It is in the Duranguito area. We lose $8 million per year if, by not building the arena, roughly 1.4 seats per day. Uh, so when Mr. Guillen says something like that, I, I, it's just not true. Well, and, of and simply, it's true because when you look at those studies, when you sit down and you read them, you realize that the only one that actually selects Union Plaza is the one that was funded by the Paso Norte Group. Which one and so it wasn't, a, it wasn't a study at all. It's more of a mm -hmm. prospectus on what we can do. It's and exactly. isn't it ironic that those members bought properties there? And as you stated before, those houses, those apartments have not been upgraded because they're just sitting on them trying to cash in. And that's unfair. It's unfair to our people. It's unfair to our city. The, any, anybody, you know, the, the city of El Paso did a tour of the, uh, of the arena project through all eight districts. 
And of the people who attended, on the exit interviews, 98% of them said that it doesn't belong downtown. Anyone, any clear person, any prudent person, can sit there and say it doesn't work downtown. It's a 12,000 seat arena. These past couple of weekends, we've had multiple uh, events downtown with the uh, Chihuahuas, with the Phantom of the Opera, Comic Con, uh, the Mariachi Festival, and there simply is no parking. It doesn't make sense to put an arena where it simply doesn't fit. Now, Courtney Nyland was very big on this. Actually, there was um, the investigation that News Channel 9 did into the four city reps meeting with the mayor um, into um, violations of uh, Texas, alleged vi violations of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Courtney Nyland was one of those there, and you were actually there as well, Mr. Guillen. One of, the, one of my questions is, as far as dealing with the media, because it was very difficult after to reach Mrs. Nyland and, and talk to many of those city council, um, uh, the city reps, how do you plan on handling the media when something probably doesn't go your way? And we'll start with you, Mr. Guillen. Sure, you know what, and, and, and by the way, that, that wasn't necessarily a meeting. Usually when you sit at a meeting, there's dialogue, there's conversations, there's back and forth. That first meeting was more of a briefing. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how it's going to mm -hmm. go down. We're very sorry. We'll look somewhere else. And with, was, all, with all the due respect, yes. you were there as a private citizen. Yes, yes, It yes. was the city council members that were being questioned. So I'm yes. not lumping you in oh, that no, no, no. Texas Open Meetings Oh, absolutely not. But, but I'm just telling you what happened. It wasn't mm -hmm. a meeting. It was a briefing. They just briefed us and said, here's our position. We're going to go and take Union Plaza off the table. But number two, all our city council, in fact, all our elected officials should always be open to the media. And they should always return phone calls as best as can, and they should always sit down and meet with them. I'm a true believer of that. Mr. Cormel. I think that um, number one priority as a city rep is your, the people that live in that district. You are beheld to them, and they're the priority. And um, I think after that comes the media. You know, they, there, there will always be an open door there. And um, I think that that is, a, you know, when somebody starts avoiding the media and doesn't want to talk about an issue. I, I think that's one of the reasons we're in, in this situation with the city council is because you know, there's a lot of people that are avoiding just being open and honest. And, and I think that um, that's a transparency issue and that's, that's why we need new leadership there. I think, I think that's why we're getting it. Mr. Acevedo. I think in the creation of an open door policy, not only for the constituents, but also for anyone from the media. Um, communication. I'm a strong communicator. I believe in communication in order to obtain goals and objectives and promote change. Uh, I would have no problem, you know, the media, you know, going along. I, I really, I'm interested in having outreach to the neighborhood associations, continue open meetings with them and, and getting to learn and understand their issues within each neighborhood because until you bring that to the table until you bring that to city council it's not the vested interest of Trini Acevedo it's the vested interest of every stakeholder within district 8 and every constituent of El Paso and that's what Trini Acevedo would do. Mr. Lopez how do you plan on handling the media? Honestly transparency I mean you can't be politicians you have to be leaders we, we can't we're going to be making difficult decisions, and those decisions have to be based on logic and reason. And if we base our, and our constituents, it always has to be putting El Paso and our constituents first. And if we do those things, sure, sometimes we're going to have to make difficult decisions that not everyone will agree with. But you stick, you have character, you have a backbone, and you stick to your guns if you believe it and you have reasons why you're doing this. And you explain it to the citizens. You explain it to the media. I think forums like this, I had never seen forums like this uh, growing up, where K KTSM is doing, uh, you know, we're, we're streaming live. I think uh, many politicians, ma many people are afraid of uh, speaking to the media because sometimes we only get sound bites. But I think forums like this, we get to, to hear a full length message, not just a little sound bite. People who care and inform citizens are watching right now. And I would like to see more things like this in El Paso. And I think it's great what KTSM is doing. I want to see everyone do this, uh, every news channel. I would love to see, you know, op-eds in, in the El Paso time, it, it, get the city council members involved. It's about communication. It's about being honest, and it's about not being a politician, but being a leader. 
Mrs. Lee Sadega. Yes, I, I agree with all the candidates' statements. I will be an accountable, ethical leader, and I think I will have an open-door policy and treat everyone with dignity and respect, including the media. Good to know. So I got a yes from all five of you. Good to know. Okay, so we started with the Arena Project. Now let's move up Mesa Street a little bit to another controversial project, and it's the Shadow Mountain Towers. They have been very controversial in the sense that Many say that the buildings are too tall to people to, uh, on the west side along Mesa and that it will change the skyline along with obstructing the view of many who live on the west side. So what is your opinion on the Shadow Mountain Towers and how do you plan on dealing with this controversial project with your constituents? We'll start with you, Mr. Acevedo. Once again, uh, this is something that was introduced to the area and once again, the lack of communication failed. It just failed. Communication failed to introduce change. I see it as a wonderful opportunity, as a tool to bring economic development into that area. It's going to promote jobs. It's going to promote growth. We're the sixth largest city in Texas, and we, are, we have to continue growing. Unfortunately, there's going to be pains and aches with traffic, with growth, but we have to maintain and we have to stay in that focus that we are growing as a city and we need to bring in jobs, we need to bring in infrastructure that will provide that strong economic development. Just a few, a few blocks down, we have, like I said, uh, Sunland Park Mall. That is a ghost town already. And we need to establish jobs for people that are graduating from UTEP or that are still studying here at UTEP and give them opportunities. And we expect places like that that are being developed to provide good paying jobs, good benefits, and ample opportunities to all the residents of El Paso. Mr. Cormel? Um, I'm, not, I'm not crazy about that. Um, I, I always try, in situations like this, I would try and, and put the people that I'm representing uh, put myself in their shoes and um, you know one of the great things that we have is a beautiful skyline here in El Paso you know you look out in the evenings and you see the sunset and you know you see the mountains and and when something is built like that in right in a neighborhood like that I, I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's very helpful I think that um, I've talked to a lot of people that live in that area we've been knocking on doors there and and there are a lot of people that are concerned you know it's you know it's a, have somebody 21 floors a, above you looking down into your yard and where your kids are at and you know you especially with drones and everything you know I, you know it's like the the privacy is already being attacked there and i think there's a lot of people that are concerned about that in in that in that area and um rightfully so i i would i would be concerned too mr guillen isn't it ironic that we want to protect one neighborhood on the west side and yet most of these people are willing to destroy el paso's first neighborhood the Union Plaza District, Duranguito, was the first neighborhood in Primer Barrio, which is why we have a Segundo Barrio. So to answer the question for all of District 8 is that all of our neighborhoods need protection, not just the west side because of a skyline, but downtown, the, uh, the Arizona area, all the way down to Buena Vista Street. All of our neighborhoods need protection. And so I would not uh, probably vote for that type of development in that neighborhood. Mrs. Lizarraga? Uh, well, I am in favor of the, the decision to permit the construction of the building. And why? Well, I, I think it's already a done deal. Mm -hmm. As far as those, though, that are against it, that live in that area, that say, like, you know, Mr. Cormel had said, 21 floors up looking down into your yard, what will you say to your constituents? Well, it's going to bring in jobs and infrastructure. Uh, I will always have an open door policy to listen to the concerns of my constituents and take that into consideration. Mr. Lopez? So I have to admit, I haven't read the studies on, on the towers, but just as I approach the arena, I would want to make sure that it's feasible, that it's uh, bettering the city. But there are legitimate concerns. And it doesn't matter to me whether it's Duranguito or it, it, all of El Paso matters, period. So we have to analyze it the same, similar ways as far as does this promote what we want in our city? Uh, I prefer to see areas such as Sunland Park or uh, the rail yards or uh, you know, areas such as the Arizona Rio Grande area be invested in. Uh, 
those are concerns, and, and I think those are legitimate concerns where pr there is privacy concerns. But we do want to see infrastructure. We do want to see growth in El Paso. Well, we are going to deal with growth no matter what. It's just, are we going to deal with it wisely, or are we going to allow, uh, you know, whether it, it is commercial groups or anybody, or are we going to do this unwisely? So it, it is something that I, I want to give a well-thought answer, but without reading the studies, I don't think that that's fair. So I, I, what I do vow to do is to make sure that I do research, I do talk to the, the, the citizens, and uh, make a decision based on information. And, you know, we're talking about developments, and, you know, Mr. Lopez, you said that El Paso is growing, and it definitely is. You have two developments. You have, is, is at least with District 8, there's, it's a span of the downtown development and then the west side development. Um, two major opposite ends of the spectrum here. So starting with you, Mrs. Lisadega, how do you plan on finding that balance of bringing, jo uh, bringing businesses to two different areas that are both in your district? Well, that's a great question. Um, in talking to b business people during my campaign, I think the, one of the things they mention most about uh, investors wanting to come to El Paso is, has to do with the decorum that they're seeing, the lack of decorum that they've seen at City Council. And so I think in order for investors to bring businesses to District 8, we would begin, I would begin by leading by example, by treating everyone with dignity and respect and uh, including colleagues, with, and especially at city council. And I'm a consensus builder, and I would resolve to, uh, to do those issues at city council. I was a testing quarter, coordinator at one of the largest high schools in El, in El Paso. And in that capacity, I had to learn how to get along with administrators, teachers, students, parents, support staff. And I believe that that's one of the things I, I bring to the table. I have a, a, a personality that I'm able to get along with people, and I think I bring balance to this district. It's a very diverse district. We have some of the richest people in the district living on the west side, and some of the poorest people in the neighborhood live on, in District 8 also. And I, I bring compassion. I'm able to, I would be able to respond to both communities and both cultures and um, I would, that's what I would do. Mr. Guillen, how do you plan on promoting both the downtown and the west side? You know what, I, I think that the apartment building that we're talking about is not gonna bring really good jobs for UTEP students. I think it'll bring, bring different levels of jobs and you know what, it simply doesn't belong there. And El Paso has a lot of real estate. When you drive out to the other district, you just see an, an abundance of land that that particular project might be better suited at instead of instead of ruin in that nice neighborhood over there. Same thing with the arena, it just doesn't make sense to put it there. You know, at the, um, if it was the only choice, it'd be good, but we have so many other choices. When you go out to the Far East side, when you go out to, uh, to the Lower Valley, when you go out to anywhere else, the Northeast, we've got so much real estate in El Paso, it's just incredible that we keep cramming everything in there. We need to expand our tax base, and we need to do it wisely, because if we don't bring in more uh, jobs into our city, uh, it's going to be hard for us. And I know people want high-paying jobs. And here's the reality, though. When you talk to the people who own businesses, when you talk to the people who, who operate uh, factories, the generation coming up isn't that well-equipped. Some of them walk in to, to uh, apply for a job. They don't bring a pen. They don't know how to do an application. So it's really challenging for us. And then you have the other people, the regular people that we know the ones that just need a job, period. You know, it's hard. I was talking to a single mom yesterday where she had to choose between paying the water bill or paying the electric bill because there simply aren't enough jobs in El Paso. And sometimes you're just hurting for her, and sometimes you've got to take a job. Thank you. Mr. Cormel? You know, I think a, a lot of what we're seeing with Sunland Park Mall and, and, and that transfer is a supply and demand thing. And I, I think one of the things as a leader, we have to, we have, I would like specifically to meet with the large business owners here on a quarterly basis, have a meeting together where we can sit down and talk about the issues that they're facing and how is the city supporting them, coming along, rallying um, alongside of them, and what are we making easier for you, and what are we doing well, and what are we not doing well. And I think in order for us to attract industry here, 
We've got to be servicing the people that we're taking care of right now. Um, you know, without that, you know, nobody's going to come and, and give somebody a, a good recommendation on bring your business here. And that's what we really need. So in order to do that, we have to have a dialogue with those, those corporations that are here right now. What can we do? How can we help you build your business? Because when they do well, ultimately, we as a city are going to do well. And it's going to alleviate the tax pressures on, on the homeowners. Mr. Acevedo? We need to provide big business whenever we go out and we sell our city and we invite them that we're open for business as a city, that we have a clear direction as to where we're headed in local government. If there's no decorum and no respect and dignity and no clear vision and mission towards what we want in the future years for El Paso, then big business will think it over. We must make everyone accountable Every player that's going to be playing in this playing field, we must make them accountable that they're going to provide good jobs for the people of El Paso. We also need to invite small business, and we need to build on what we have and take from the experience. Mr. Rosen from Texas Store in downtown, Mr. Martin Silva from Silva Supermarket, how have they survived downtown? I know it's hard, and hard times are coming. Uh, there's a lot of things that we have no control of. The evolution of technology, the peso devaluation, the long lines on the bridge. A lot of factors contribute to our economy as a border city. So we need to bring all of those things to the table, but how can we partner with big business and small business in improving the quality of life of every El Paso? And finally, to wrap things up, Mr. Lopez, how do you plan on promoting the downtown and the west side? I think uh, Mr. Acevedo and Mr. Cormel uh, both touched on it. I think it's working with small businesses, and I think it's also working with uh, large businesses. And being strategic about how we approach each project. Each area of town is different, and we have to use, we have to work with uh, each, each biz business in its own unique way that to make sure that we are, are using, utilizing uh, each potential um, area. But I do believe that we encourage business here. We have to, we have to let uh, corporations know that we are open for business. El Paso is open for business. That we do want to give, uh, we mentioned it earlier, uh, tax abatements. And that is to small businesses along with large businesses. We want to see uh, innovation. We want to see uh, uh, the city strategic plan that's worked with, uh, I believe it's the Borderplex uh, Alliance uh, Regional Plan as well, where they've kept jobs uh, here from Fred Loya Insurance Company. They've kept jobs, uh, they got uh, Indigo Hotel here. Uh, we want to see a plan working together again with county officials, state officials, and city officials, working together with the business community, small and large, um, in order, because no one person has the complete answer. It's us as a group together, working together, that we can come up with these solutions. And we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to give you guys each two minutes for a, kind of a closing statement. You know, two times five is 10, so a good 10 minutes left. But the final question is, how are you going to be the, actually, I'm sorry, our final question comes from Jaime. How are you going to be the same or different than Courtney Nyland, who you will be replacing, and why should the voter vote for you? And we'll start with you, Mr. Acevedo. The difference will be that I will be accessible to the people. I will be accessible to the neighborhood associations. I want to promote change, but through with communication, using all of the educational com components that I have been able to gather throughout my educational journey of having that master's in public administration and now working in that doctoral in organizational leadership. I have those components that are required to be a, a good and effective leader in city council. Once my previous experience of working with CDBG as a chairman and working with neighborhood associations and addressing projects that have been completed and there are there on the books that I was able to push them forward when I was appointed by, by Beto O'Rourke, our congressman. There's a lot of projects that were completed not only in the south side but also in Montoya and throughout the city of El Paso that have improved the quality of life of each and every El Pasoan. Mr. Cormel? First of all, um, 
the big difference is I'm a guy, she's a girl. But <laughs> <laughs> I think we could all use some laughs tonight. But <laughs> any, anyways, thank you for, for having us here. But I, I, I think um, right now what we need is somebody that has business experience, somebody that understands whether it's run, running a small business or a large business, what it's like to make payroll. And I think that we've, had a, we've been void of that down there. We need somebody that has common sense about approaching. They need to be able to relate well. I know there's a lot of bashing for, um, it's easy to bash on, on people that are downtown that have bought these buildings and they haven't, you know, they're, they're working on it and stuff. But what I can say for the people that are doing that, they're at least investing in that area. And they're, and they're putting out a lot of money to do it. And it's no different than me putting a small chunk on a couple houses um, on Arizona or doing that. But I think as what we tend to forget is, is we want to bash that person or this idea or that idea. And we got to understand that as a, we're a community. We're El Paso. We're a whole group. And, and we, gotta, we have to stop looking and saying, well, that person's bad, this person's good, and I'm going to do it better than that. We need to say, hey, I, together, I, I mean, for Courtney, I, you know, uh, I, I, feel, I feel, feel bad that she had to step down f for those reasons. Um, she's going through a difficult time and, and needs a lot of prayer and support during that time. But I think for us setting up here and saying, well, I'm not going to be like her, I'm, what I can tell you is I'm going to be like what I've, what I've always been. I've served the community. We've worked with thousands of youth here in El Paso. We love the city. We love the whole city, not just a part of it. And we want to see it represented well in class. And I think that we can, we can put a, a, a city council together that looks like that and encourage people to come out and vote and encourage people to be a part of the process. And that's what I like to do. And that's why I like to be this next city rep for District 8. Mr. Cormel, thank you. And Mr. Guillen, how do you plan on being the same or different than Courtney Nyland? And why should the voter vote for you? You know what? With regard to the downtown buildings, there is no investment. People are buying them and just sitting on them. Isn't it funny how the richest families in El Paso own those buildings, and yet they've left them and they've allowed them to become eyesores and dilapidated? And then if any one of us in here allows the grass to grow on the city sidewalk in front of our house, we get nailed immediately. And so the difference between myself and, and Courtney would be that I will return phone calls, I will be out answering the doors to everyone. You know, Courtney was notorious for only talking to the rich guys and never to the small businesses as you walk down Delta. You mentioned the, uh, the difference between are we going to develop the west side of the downtown, and that's fine, but district data is so much more. We have businesses from Fox Plaza all the way through Central, through the left side of, of Five Points, and then the Donovan Corridor. So, and then, and then all along Mesa on the left side. So it's an entire process that we would have to look at. And we would work with them, we would do the sidewalk sessions, and I would absolutely positively re return phone calls and visit with everyone, not just the rich people. Mrs. Lee Sadega? Yes. As I mentioned before, I think I bring balance to this race. Um, I am comfortable with both communities, with both cultures, and I think I could represent both well. I, I feel comfortable walking into sac as comfortable walking into Sacred Heart as I do walking into Whole Foods. I am a person of my word. I am a hard worker. I will bring accountable, ethical leadership to District 8. Um, I'm a member of the Sunset Neighborhood, Im uh, Neighborhood Improvement Association. And when we had set up a meeting with Courtney uh, and she was supposed to show up, I, I know firsthand, I have firsthand experience when a representative is invited and communicates to that organization that they're going to show up and then does not show up. So I am a person of my word. I'm a hard worker. I'm methodical and organized and I'm a detailed oriented person and I will treat everyone with dignity and respect. Mr. Lopez, to wrap things up, how do you plan to be the same or different from Courtney Nyland and why should the voter vote for you? Well. I can't speak for Courtney as far as uh, differences, but what I can tell you is that it's about being, again, not, not being a politician. It's about being a leader. It's not about Adolfo Lopez. It's about El Paso. It's about, it's, it's about us. And so I've been fortunate in my life. I got an education and I'm a lawyer. And so, and I'm an ad adversarial lawyer. So every day I deal with negotiations uh, when I was a prosecutor and now as a criminal defense attorney. Sometimes you deal with difficult people, but on city council, it's never about personally attacking someone. That's immature. It just has no place in, it, uh, in government. And what I can promise you is that I will, I will work 
to bring everyone together. I, I've come from the Lower Valley. My great-grandparents, I spent time in, in Segundo Vario growing up. I lived in Central as, as soon as I got back to El Paso. Uh, I live in Sunset Heights. I spent the time in the West Side. Uh, I've blocked walked the Northeast. It's about uniting. It's about bringing us together in a, in a very special time in our city. And it's about not being obstructionist, but about being uh, someone who is an optimist, but being logical and reasonable, and not wasting our funds, being wise. And that's what I, I'm very excited. I, I believe that this new city council, uh, it, it's a majority going to be new. A uh, new mayor, uh, I believe it's going to be a total of five uh, city council members. It's an exciting period, and we have the ability to really push El Paso to it, it, its limits, it, it, to where we want to see it go. We're not going to, I'm, we're not going to be stuck in the past. We got to move to the future. And at the end of the day, it's about putting all Paso first, and that's it. All right, well, the five candidates, thank you so much for joining us tonight. That is all the time that we have for tonight's District 8 City Rep Forum. Remember, early voting starts May 30th, and it ends on June 6th with the election day for your District 8 Rep, along with the mayoral runoff on June 10th. A big thanks again to all of our five candidates. Again, we have Gilbert Guillen, Robert Cormel, Sissi Lizarraga, Adolfo Lopez, and Trinidad Acevedo. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm your moderator, Farron Franzak, and we will see you back here on air and on Facebook Live for News Channel 9 at 10. Have a good night.